On October 24, 1944, during World War II's Pacific Climax, the United States Navy, emboldened by their recent triumphs in the Battle of the Sibuyan Sea and the Surigao Strait, unwittingly plunged headlong into a cunning trap set by the Japanese. Under the impression that the enemy forces near Leyte had fled, Admiral William Halsey directed the mighty US Third Fleet northward to confront what he thought was the main threat. Yet this northern Japanese fleet was merely a decoy, composed of antiquated vessels and devoid of air support. As America's most potent ships vacated Leyte, Admiral Kurita's center force stealthily re-entered the now undefended waters. This move left General Douglas MacArthur's troops, on the brink of liberating the Philippines, dangerously unprotected. All Kurita had to do now was strike at the landing forces, and the fate of the war would be dramatically shifted. However, amid this looming threat, a glimmer of hope persisted. The defense of the landings fell to Taffy Three, a modest fleet consisting of six escort carriers, three destroyers, and four destroyer escorts. This underdog squadron stood as the sole barrier against Kurita's armada, which boasted four battleships, including Yamato, the world's largest, and six heavy cruisers, two light cruisers, and eleven destroyers. The sailors of Taffy Three, with the fate of the free world on their shoulders, braced to confront Kurita. Their actions that day would not only determine the outcome of this critical battle, but also the lives of thousands of American troops setting foot on the beaches of Leyte. Before the war, the Philippines had been a crucial piece of the American Commonwealth, which rapidly became a pivotal strategic location in the Pacific as the clouds of war gathered on the horizon. MacArthur, appointed as the commander of US forces in the Far East, understood the significance of the archipelago. However, the Japanese invasion of the Philippines in December 1941 rapidly overwhelmed the American and Filipino forces. Despite MacArthur's expertise and the bravery of his troops, they were ill-prepared for the magnitude and speed of the Japanese assault. Under-resourced and caught off guard, US forces struggled to hold their ground against the Japanese offensive. The fall of the Philippines was a significant blow to the Allied forces. MacArthur was ordered to evacuate to Australia by President Roosevelt, leaving behind his men. This departure was deeply personal for MacArthur, who had developed a strong affinity for the Filipino people after his man had fought side by side with them in some of the most grueling battles in the early days of the war. His famous vow, I shall return, was not just a promise to his troops, but also a commitment to the people of the Philippines. It reflected his deep-seated belief in their right to freedom and self-determination. MacArthur was determined for his promise to be more than rhetoric. It was a strategic objective he was chosen to fulfill. In Australia, he began planning the counter-offensive to retake the Philippines. However, the path to liberation was not straightforward. The Pacific theater of World War II was vast and strategic priorities often shifted. The Allied forces had to consider various factors, such as the availability of resources, the strength of the Japanese troops, and the geopolitical implications of their actions. Several factors influenced the decision to prioritize the liberation of the Philippines in 1944. Firstly, the Philippines' geographical location made it a vital strategic point for launching further operations into Japan. Secondly, the Philippines' liberation would cut Japan from its occupied territories in Southeast Asia, weakening its resource supply lines. Additionally, the moral and psychological impact of fulfilling MacArthur's promise to the Filipino people could not be underestimated. It was a powerful symbol of hope and resilience for the Allied forces and the oppressed nations in the region. Finally, by October 1944, the pieces were set for the landing on Leyte Island and the beginning of the Philippines' liberation. It was a meticulously planned operation combining naval, air and ground forces. MacArthur personally oversaw the operation, understanding the significance of this moment. But the Philippines were just as crucial for the Japanese, if not more important than they were to the Allies. Losing the archipelago would be like conceding an open path for the enemy to reach the main Japanese islands. This scenario had to be stopped at all costs. Thus, even when the Imperial Japanese Navy had been all but shattered by 1944, they were ready to throw all of their might into the Philippines in a desperate attempt to halt MacArthur from keeping his word. The ensuing encounters would be some of the most intense naval clashes in the Pacific, while on land, both sides would suffer massive casualties. 
The Filipino guerrillas, who had continued to resist the Japanese occupation, would be a significant asset to the American forces. The liberation of the Philippines was not just a strategic checkmark, but also a fulfillment of a moral obligation. The planned landings in the Philippines would result in a series of brutal naval encounters known as the Battle of Leyte Gulf. Intricate strategic movements marked the battle's beginnings. The combined American and Australian forces stood on one side, led by General Douglas MacArthur and Admiral William Halsey. They were determined to invade Leyte as a crucial step in severing Japan's links to its Southeast Asian territories. Opposing them, the Imperial Japanese Navy, under various commanders, was poised to fiercely defend their hold. The first significant confrontation erupted in the Sibuyan Sea on October 24, 1944. The American Third Fleet, commanded by Admiral Halsey, engaged the Japanese center force. The encounter proved costly for the Japanese, as the mighty battleship Musashi was sunk. Vice Admiral Takeo Kurita had to retreat from the battle with no chance of overcoming the might of the Third Fleet. Halsey, underestimating Kurita, believed the Japanese commander was temporarily incapacitated. However, the astute Kurita quickly redirected towards Leyte, aiming to infiltrate the landing zones while the Third Fleet was preoccupied. Simultaneously, a significant development occurred at the Surijiao Strait. The Japanese Southern Force, split into factions led by Vice Admirals Shoji Nishimura and Kiyohide Shima, unknowingly sailed into an ambush. The US 7th Fleet, commanded by Vice Admiral Thomas Kincaid, brilliantly executed a naval maneuver, gaining a tactical advantage by crossing the T of the Japanese fleet. This encounter, marking the final battleship-to-battleship -battleship clash in history, signified the end of a renowned era in naval warfare. It ended disastrously for Nishimura's squadron, including losing his flagship. Shima, arriving later, retreated after seeing the destruction. Elsewhere, a crucial ambush was set near Cape Engano, where Vice Admiral Jisaburo Ozawa's northern force distracted the main American fleet from Leyte. Admiral Halsey, leading the Third Fleet, mistakenly believed he had located the primary Japanese carrier group and pursued Ozawa's decoy northward. This decoy fleet, comprising two World War I-era battleships modified into carriers, three light cruisers and nine destroyers, carried 108 aircraft, this was enough to convince the Allies of their authenticity and pose a significant threat to their landing operations. Halsey's decision to pursue the Japanese decoy left the San Bernardino Strait unprotected, allowing Kurita's forces an almost unchallenged route toward the Leyte landing zones. This series of engagements, characterized by intense combat, strategic deceptions and tremendous firepower, laid the groundwork for the dramatic Battle of Samar. In a classic David and Goliath encounter, Kurita's overpowering center force faced the considerably smaller U.S. task force, Taffy 3, comprising escort carriers and destroyer escorts. Halsey's decision to redirect the entire strength of the Third Fleet northward to engage the Japanese Northern Force's carriers left the San Bernardino Strait completely unguarded. Most senior officers in the Seventh Fleet assumed Halsey would direct his three available carrier groups northward but leave the battleships of Task Force 34 to guard the San Bernardino Strait against the Japanese center force. However, Halsey had not yet formed Task Force 34, and six battleships and every available cruiser and destroyer of the Third Fleet were moving north. This critical misunderstanding led the Allies to falsely believe the strait was protected when, in reality, it was exposed to a potential Japanese advance. Consequently, Kurita's center force passed through the unguarded San Bernardino Strait at 3 a.m. on October 25th, proceeding southward along the coast of Samar. They faced only the 7th Fleet's three escort carrier units, known as Taffy 1, 2 and 3. These units consisted of 16 small, slow and unarmored escort carriers, each carrying up to 28 aircraft. They were shielded by a screen of lightly armed and unarmored destroyers and destroyer escorts, the primary role of Taffy 1, 2 and 3, operating as part of Escort Carrier Group 77.4 of the US 7th Fleet, was reconnaissance and ground support for the forces landing in Leyte Gulf. These groups were ill-equipped for a confrontation with a full Japanese surface fleet. Despite losses in the Palawan Passage and the Sibuyan Sea, the Japanese center force remained a force to be reckoned with, comprising four battleships, including the massive Yamato, six heavy cruisers, two light cruisers, and 11 destroyers. 
Directly in Kurita's path was Taffy 3, a modest force of six escort carriers, half the size of standard aircraft carriers, three destroyers, and four destroyer escorts. The six escort carriers of Taffy 3 hosted over 150 aircraft, predominantly armed for anti-personnel and anti-submarine warfare, making them poorly suited for engaging the Kurita's imposing fleet. The vast disparity in size and firepower between the opposing fleets was starkly evident. The Japanese battleship Yamato alone displaced nearly as much water as the entire Taffy 3 group. In fact, one of Yamato's turrets was heavier than Taffy 3's flagship, USS Fanshawe Bay. To say that Taffy 3 was outgunned and outnumbered is a profound understatement. Despite this, destiny set the stage for a confrontation between Taffy 3 and Kurita's center force off the island of Samar. On the morning of October 25th at 5.45 a.m., Ensign Bill Brooks, piloting a TBM Avenger, took off from the USS St. Lo for an anti-submarine patrol near Samar in the Philippines. That morning, three additional Avengers and two older Wildcat fighters expanded their search northwestward, scouting for Japanese activity. Heavy clouds initially hindered their visibility, but just after 6.30 a.m., a break in the clouds allowed Brooks to descend to 4,000 feet. Below, he spotted the ominous silhouettes of large warships heading southeast toward Taffy 3. Brooks initially mistook these ships for vessels from Admiral William Halsey's U.S. Third Fleet, remarking to his turret gunner, quote, look at that, Halsey must have come down from the north. His gunner, relieved, assumed they were friendly forces. However, Brooks grew suspicious on closer observation. There were no aircraft carriers among the 23 ships, and their designs were unlike any American or British warships he recognized. Realizing he had encountered a Japanese surface force, not an American one, Brooks urgently relayed this information via USS St. Lowe's radio. His message, a warning of an approaching enemy force comprising four battleships, four heavy cruisers, two light cruisers, and 10 to 12 destroyers located 20 miles northwest of their task group and advancing at 30 knots was a pivotal moment preceding the battle off Samar, part of the larger battle of Leyte Gulf. Brooks's report reached Taffy 3's commander, Rear Admiral Clifton Ziggy Sprague, aboard USS Fanshawe Bay. Skeptical, Sprague initially assumed the inexperienced aviator might have misidentified an American surface force. The idea of a Japanese force of such magnitude so close to the landing zones seemed implausible. He believed it must be an Allied fleet. He instructed Brooks to confirm the identity of the ships. Upset by the skepticism and request for re-verification, Ensign Brooks daringly descended to just 2,000 feet above the Japanese warships amidst a sky ablaze with flak fire. In this hazardous position, he flew over Admiral Kurita's flagship, the Yamato. Despite the intense anti-aircraft barrage, Brooks and his radio man managed to capture photographs of the enemy formation. Brooks meticulously confirmed the coordinates before contacting Fanshawe Bay again. This time, he reported unmistakable characteristics of the Japanese fleet, the distinct pagoda masts typical of Japanese warships, and the, quote, largest at meatball flag he had ever seen atop the largest battleship he had ever seen, conclusively confirming a considerable Japanese presence. As Brooks relayed the imminent threat, the escort carrier group 77.4 crews were settling down for breakfast at 6.30 a.m. when Japanese radio chatter was intercepted. Assuming the Japanese fleet was over 100 miles away, the radio men initially thought the signals were from Japanese-controlled islands in the Philippines. However, within minutes, Brooks's reports were taken seriously. A massive Japanese fleet was just 20 miles away and rapidly approaching. Admiral Sprague, commanding the Taffy 3 flagship USS Fanshawe Bay, promptly ordered the launch of every available plane, armed with whatever weaponry was on hand. The carrier crews manned their 5-inch guns, the largest in their arsenal. By 11.58 a.m., distant flashes of light on the horizon heralded the arrival of enemy fire, soon followed by towering waterspouts as shells began to search for the American ships. While firepower, the number of ships, men, and the element of surprise were all against the American force, there was one crucial factor in their favor. Kurita was unaware he was confronting a minor American task force. Fully aware of the overwhelming odds and the potential destruction of his entire task force, Sprague recognized the necessity of engagement. Allowing Kurita to reach the landing zones was not an option. Even a defensive stance would buy the Allies crucial time for a later interception. 
Sprague instructed his carriers to launch their planes and then sought cover in a rain squall to the east. Though the warplanes, armed primarily with anti-submarine weapons, were ill-equipped to damage Kurita's massive surface ships, Sprague hoped they could at least distract the enemy. He then commanded his destroyers and destroyer escorts to create a smokescreen, concealing the retreating carriers. From the Japanese perspective, the true nature of the American force remained obscured, shrouded in smoke and cloud cover. Kurita, unaware that Ozawa's decoy had successfully drawn the US Third Fleet north, assumed he had encountered a segment of Halsey's Third Fleet. He mistakenly believed he was up against six Essex-class fleet carriers, escorted by battleships and over ten heavy cruisers. This misjudgment led him to fear that he might be outgunned and outmatched. This error significantly influenced the Japanese response. Below deck on the battleship Yamato, crew members hastily loaded massive 18.1-inch armor-piercing shells, bracing for what they believed would be a monumental naval clash. The rest of the Japanese fleet similarly prepared for battle, unaware of the actual makeup of their adversary. Kurita's decision to deploy his ships into anti-aircraft formation followed by an order for a general attack. Splitting his fleet into divisions to attack independently further complicated the situation. The battle commenced with the Yamato firing its colossal shells at Taffy 3. Initially, the American smokescreen protected the carrier escorts, causing the shots to miss. However, as the battle intensified, the shells began landing increasingly closer to the larger US vessels, escalating the conflict to a critical juncture. Where of the dire situation, Lieutenant Commander Ernest E. Evans, commanding USS Johnston and positioned closest to the enemy, took decisive action. Remembering his promise at the ship's commissioning that USS Johnston was a fighting ship meant to confront danger, he steered his vastly outmatched vessel at flank speed directly toward the Japanese fleet. Johnston bravely charged alone, torpedoing Kumano and forcing her to break formation, a bold move that defied the expected one-sided nature of the battle. Inspired by Johnston's daring, Sprague ordered destroyers Hull and Hearman, along with the destroyer escort Samuel B. Roberts, to engage. Despite overwhelming odds, these ships courageously faced the Japanese force, aiming to disrupt their operations and provide an edge to the US forces. As these ships closed in on the enemy, Lieutenant C. Dr. Copeland of Samuel B. Roberts announced over the loudspeaker that they were entering a battle with, quote, overwhelming odds from which survival could not be expected. The Japanese onslaught continued, with Hole and Roberts taking multiple hits and quickly sinking. Having expended all its torpedoes, Johnston fought valiantly with its five-inch guns, until ultimately being overwhelmed by a group of Japanese destroyers. Meanwhile, the escort carriers retaliated with their limited firepower, one five-inch gun each. The carriers were instructed to engage the enemy with whatever they had, even if these were merely pea shooters. Each carrier targeted an enemy ship as soon as it was within range. Fanshawe Bay fired on a cruiser, scoring several hits. Kalinin Bay aimed at a Miyoko-class heavy cruiser, claiming hits on its turrets. Gambia Bay engaged a cruiser, achieving multiple hits. And White Plains reported hits on several targets. By this time, Taffy 1 and Taffy 2 had moved close enough to assist the embattled Taffy 3. Rear Admiral Thomas Sprague directed the 16 escort carriers across his three task units to launch all 450 of their aircraft, armed with whatever weapons were available, even if limited to machine guns or depth charges. This massive air assault aimed to support Taffy 3's valiant stand against the Japanese force. The escort carriers primarily carried aircraft designed for patrol and anti-submarine duties, such as the older FM-2 Wildcats and TBM Avenger torpedo bombers. This was in contrast to Halsey's fleet carriers, equipped with the latest aircraft and a wide array of anti-shipping ordnance. Nevertheless, the lack of air cover for the Japanese force allowed Sprague's planes to attack, without the threat of Japanese fighter aircraft interference. As the battle intensified, the carriers of Taffy 3 turned south, maneuvering through the intense shell fire. Gambia Bay, positioned at the rear of the American formation, bore the brunt of the assault from the battleship Yamato. It sustained multiple hits and eventually capsized at 9.07 a.m., with four Grumman TBM Avenger torpedo bombers descending alongside it. Several other carriers incurred damage but managed to escape. 
Admiral Kurita's perplexity grew due to the staunch American resistance, leading him to confirm his belief that he was facing a significant portion of the Third Fleet. His retreat was fueled by the idea that a more formidable US fleet lay to the north. The chaos from his general attack order, further aggravated by air and torpedo attacks, peaked when Yamato, his flagship, turned north to dodge torpedoes, losing touch with the battle. Kurita abruptly disengaged and ordered his fleet northward at 20 knots, aiming to reorganize his scattered forces. His battle report later mentioned receiving intel about a group of American carriers to his north. Preferring to engage capital ships rather than transports, Kurita pursued this lead, missing his chance to devastate the shipping in Leyte Gulf and disrupt the critical Leyte landings. After failing to find the non-existent carriers, which were far to the north, Kurita retreated towards San Bernardino Strait. The fierce resistance had inflicted significant damage, sinking three of his heavy cruisers and convincing him that further pursuit would only lead to more Japanese losses. Miscommunication among Japanese forces and the absence of air reconnaissance meant Kurita remained unaware that the deception had worked and he faced only a small outgunned force instead of the full might of the Third Fleet. Thus, Kurita believed he had been battling elements of the Third Fleet and feared encirclement and destruction by Halsey's forces. Post-war Rear Admiral Clifton Sprague informed his colleague Aubrey Fitch that he believed the Japanese retreat was primarily due to the heavy damage they sustained, a view he maintained would be validated by objective analysis. Most of Kurita's surviving ships managed to escape. Halsey and the Third Fleet's battleships arrived too late to intercept him. Nagato and Congo had suffered moderate damage from air attacks by Taffy 3's escort carriers. Of the five battleships Kurita began with, only Yamato and Haruna remained combat ready upon their return. Kurita's advance towards Leyte represented Japan's last significant opportunity to disrupt the Philippine landings. His retreat in the face of the extraordinary bravery of US sailors, who successfully convinced him of facing a far superior force, marked a pivotal moment in the Pacific theater. Facing limited options to strike at the landing zones, Vice Admiral Takijiro Onishi activated his Japanese special attack units from bases on Luzon, launching desperate kamikaze attacks against Allied ships in Leyte Gulf, as well as the escort carrier units off Samar. The Taffy 3 escort carrier St. Lo was struck by a kamikaze aircraft and sank following a series of internal explosions. The relentless kamikaze assaults damaged carriers Kitkin Bay, White Plains, and USS Kalinin Bay, which nevertheless survived the attacks. Despite Taffy 3's heroic efforts, which prevented a potential catastrophe for the Allied operations, Halsey faced severe criticism for his decision to redirect Task Force 34 north in pursuit of Ozawa. His actions spawned a piece of US Navy slang, Bull's Run, a moniker that merged Halsey's nickname Bull with a reference to the Battle of Bull Run in the American Civil War, symbolizing a defeat brought on by poor organization and indecision. Clifton Sprague, commander of Task Unit April 3rd, 77, during the Battle of Samar, later expressed strong disapproval of Halsey's decision and his failure to inform Kincaid and the 7th Fleet that their northern flank was unprotected, stating, quote, In the absence of any information, it was logical to assume that our northern flank could not be exposed without ample warning. Halsey defended his northern advance in his post-battle report, quote, Searches by my carrier planes revealed the northern carrier force on the afternoon of October 24th, completing the picture of all enemy naval forces. Guarding San Bernardino Strait statically seemed pointless, so I concentrated Task Force 38 overnight and headed north to strike at dawn. I believed the center force, heavily damaged in the Sibuyan Sea, posed no significant threat to the 7th Fleet. The Battle of Samar is a testament to extraordinary heroism, averting a major defeat for the US Navy and sparing Halsey further embarrassment. Yet this incredible feat came at a high cost. Over 1,000 American lives were lost, 913 sailors were injured, and the loss of two escort carriers, two destroyers, one destroyer escort, and 23 aircraft. Many of the casualties occurred well after the battle, as the US Navy hesitated to initiate rescue operations due to fears of submarine attacks. Many Taffy 3 survivors, including those from the Gambier Bay, Howell, Johnston and Roberts, were not rescued until October 27th, spending two days adrift. A plane had spotted the survivors, but the relayed location was incorrect. 
By the time help arrived, many had succumbed to exposure, thirst and shark attacks. US sailors achieved the unthinkable by triumphing over a vastly superior force. For their extraordinary bravery, Taffy 3 was awarded a presidential unit citation. The essence of their feat was aptly captured by Thomas Stevenson, a survivor of Samuel B. Roberts, as quote, Well, I think it was really just determination that really meant something. I can't believe that they didn't just go in and wipe us out. We confused the Japanese so much, I think it deterred them. It was a great experience.